Let's, let's make it. Let's make it happen. We'll make it happen. Sure. Okay, guys. It looks like we're live. So, um, welcome to the Habitats panel. I'll start with introducing myself. Uh, I'm Jazz Purawal. I'm going to be the moderator for this panel today. <laughs> Thank you, Root. <laughs> uh, so my personal background is astrophysics. I've had some experience with analogs. Last year, I built my own habitat and lived with it and did a solo mission during the pandemic. And I'm hoping to do many, many more analogs at the various different habitats in the future. So uh, we will kick off this panel with everybody just giving a short introduction about themselves. And obviously, feel free to talk about your habitat as well. Uh, so we'll just go around one at a time. Um, Lessig, should we start with you? All right. Um, so, hello, everyone. It's great to be here. The first Analog Astronaut Conference. Great thing. Um, I'm I'm in Poland, so I will introduce you to our uh, Lunaris Analog Habitat. Uh, so I have several screen, uh, uh, yeah, uh, several pictures to show you, and then I will just probably um, let the other person, another person, to introduce their own their, their habitats. Hello, um, hello. 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 Good to see you. So, um, hi, we were just starting. So, um, I will quickly go through my slides and then I guess, um, yeah, uh, we can all later see Michaela and say hello. Um, so, Lunaris Habitat is uh, located in Poland, in, in fact, in the middle of the city of Piwa. So this is in the former military air, airfield uh, where we uh, used the former uh, bunker hangar for, uh, the, for military bombers to create our own EVA area. This area is secured, is out of uh, reach by uh, every day from, from like pedestrians, but it is in the middle of the city, nevertheless. Um, I changed my slides. As I mentioned, uh, we have like there is we can we can different, differentiate two uh, parts of the habitat, the EVA area. So the old bunker, it's 300 square meters of uh, isolated uh, space where we put it uh, basalts and sands, and this is where we are doing our space so the spacewalk simulations. Then we are going through airlock to the research station. Without any windows, this is an isolation facility. So if you are going there, coming there, you are staying there for two weeks without windows, and the whole uh, day-night cycle is simulated using LED lights. Um, and the station itself, it's uh, several modules uh, surrounded, uh, like they're uh, all um, around this center area called an atrium that is domed. But from there, you can go to our workshops, gym, uh, operations, so your office, a small dormitory that is all your capsule hotel, so six uh, capsules that, you're, and that the crew is sleeping in, uh, kitchen, small bio lab, and the hygiene module where we are currently doing some uh, studies on uh, water usage and gray water production. And obviously, you can go inside the uh, hangar to do your EVAs. So, no sunlight for two weeks, um, um, and basically, uh, we are doing a lot of isolation studies with uh, many partners around the world uh, currently. Um, this is uh, we are doing our um, um, mission control remotely, so we have all the cameras everywhere. We are looking how uh, the mission progress. We are uh, in contact with with. Uh, uh, any given crew, and to this date, since we started in 2017, we've done 11 analog missions. The next one, Hekata, is will start on uh, Wednesday uh, in cooperation with Austrian Space Forum. And what I would like to share here is that we are very proud that we have like this uh, gender parity uh, goal uh, at, with our team. So we. For uh, some, like we have um, almost 50 50 ratio when it comes to female commanders, 40% of female participants, over 70 people were isolated here from 15 different countries. And well, um, I guess this is part of anticipating what the future of human space, space flight will uh, look like. And it's all also very nice to mentioned that I guess it is a place where uh, Sian and JJ Hastings met during their 
um, um, Spectra uh, three uh, Spectra mission created by uh, Sarah Jane Pell. Uh, it, it it was in 2018. I may be wrong, but maybe this, it, it was the first mission they uh, they had together. And I know that we are going getting short on time, so we sh I should like let someone else to present their own habit. Thanks so much, Lessix. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Kai, would you like to uh, go next? Certainly. Hi, my name is Kai Stotz. I'm uh, coming to you from Cascabel, Arizona. And a brief, brief intro on my background. I've worked in uh, Linux and high-performance computing. I've worked in uh, machine learning applied to radio astronomy and gravitational wave astronomy at LIGO. And for the last four years, I've been working principally in the um, simulation, computer simulation, and now the the physical world simulation of a habitat on the moon and Mars. And I'm gonna switch quickly to um, a short slideshow. So I'm gonna stop my cam, let's see, share my screen just a moment. Hopefully I'll get the right screen this time. Okay, there we go, good. Can everyone see my slides? Looks good. Yeah, looks good. Okay, great. So we are building, uh, we are currently under construction of a brand new analog called SAM. It's a space analog for the moon and Mars. It is being built at the world-renowned Biosphere 2 outside of local Arizona. And uh, so it's just an incredible place to work. We're not actually in the biosphere itself, but we are um, off to the side of just a few hundred meters away. And uh, are working with the historic test module. The test module was a uh, prototype for the biosphere. This was built in 1987 and operated through 89 um, as a means of testing the glass, the hermetic seal, the lung for the automated pressure regulation. And so you can see these are the original eight biospherians on the right hand side. And uh, they did up to three week stays with fully bioregenerative life support uh, inside of the steel greenhouse. <clears throat> and uh, we'll go into details of how this worked. Um, this is uh, my associate Trent Trent and I'm working on the very first. Mm -hmm. Oh dear, it looks like uh, we lost Kai there. He's in an area of pretty bad internet connection. So um, in the meantime, we'll move on. Hopefully he'll join us again, but we'll move on to Attila. Attila, can you hear me? All right. In that case, <laughs> Michaela, would you like to go next? Sure, no problem. Let's hope this works. All right. Well, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Michaela Musulova. I'm the director of the HICES uh, analog facility. Um, let's see how this share screening is going to work. Um, okay. Um, sorry. Uh, oh, here we go. All right. Uh, can you see the uh, PowerPoint okay? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, if you're not familiar, this is the high seas facility. It's uh, on the volcano Mauna Loa in Hawaii on the big island. Uh, the main part is this small white dome you can see in the picture and the adjacent uh, facility next to it. Um, and it's mostly solar power. You can see the solar panels outside that we do have a backup generator, worst case scenario, and hopefully we'll have a hydrogen fuel cell as another backup in the future. This is what it looks like on the inside in the, the main picture. It's a panorama picture, so it looks you know, a bit bigger than it is, but everyone has their own workstation. Uh, we have a hydroponic uh, lettuce grow tree, which in this picture looks like a little wannabe Christmas tree <laughs> because it was that time of the year. We have different exercise facilities, but it's all basically in this main room. And then each person has their own bedroom. You can see in the top right picture, there's me for scale inside one of the bedrooms. This was back when I was meant to be on an eight month mission in the habitat. Now the bedrooms look a little bit different. So I need to update that picture. There's also a kitchen area in the back, uh, two bathrooms. We have composting toilets to be used there and a urinal, which both the men and women use so that the composting toilets don't have too much liquid in them. Okay, and uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Slide, please. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you. Sorry? Move the slides. We're seeing just one slide for some reason. Sorry. Uh, so which, which one are you seeing now? Number one. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, that is weird because I'm already on number three now. 
Um, hmm. So what, what are you seeing now? Just to tell me, <laughs> just to be sure, what am I looking at? Do you see the main room or do you see the-, the No, bubble? you're on slide number one still. Okay, well then it's, yeah, it's not, not sharing properly. So maybe I'll just leave it, uh, why don't I just leave it on this screen? Can you see this okay? It, it just moved actually, you just moved slides. Um, okay, oh well, I think there must be some kind of delay then. Um, so this was the one I was talking about. So hopefully you can see this. Yeah, we can see it now. Version. Uh, zoom in a little bit. But this was the one I was saying is that the main room, uh, basically most activities happen in this main room. Uh, there are some other facilities you don't see on the picture, including engineering bay where the suits are and uh, different technological equipment, including a 3D printer. Then we all have our own little bedroom and you can see in the top right picture. And then there's the bathrooms I mentioned and a lab. And you'll see that in another picture later on. Uh, water is limited to only a couple of gallons a day per person. So you can see people using a bucket system to wash the dishes in the picture on the left and uh, a red bucket uh, with another small little container in there. That, that's your shower, quote unquote. And you're only allowed to have one couple gallon shower every two weeks. Freeze-dried food is probably similar uh, to other analog facilities, so it's all basically freeze-dried dehydrated food in the form you can see in the pictures or uh, in powder form. Then we have a mission control facility built also on the same island uh, in a different location about an hour and a half away. You can see in the pictures on the right hand side we have cameras uh, to look inside the habitat. We can monitor the electricity, water, and other, um, for example, CO2 levels inside the habitat, give the crews warning. We also have a you know report system in place every day. The crew submits their scientific, engineering, and other reports. We vary the time delay in communications depending on what kind of simulation is going on. We do both lunar and Martian simulations. And yeah, we keep the crews busy with a schedule of different research activities, exercise, um, even things like doing inventory, and then the, the report writing is a must every day. I'm just quickly going through this uh, since there's some technical glitches and all. And then we do different types of uh, research during our mission. So here are just some examples. This was meant to fly in later as part of the PowerPoint, but basically I'll put this to one side. Uh, there's a lot of amazing geology around us, lava tubes. You can see uh, in the picture on the top left, uh, some are difficult to access. You can see me for scale standing above one of the entrances on the left-hand side. Some of them are really big, so we do space architecture research uh, to see if we, they could use as habitats. Others we study for astrobiology research, for example, have a collaboration with NASA Goddard. We also do a lot of rover testing. You can see the top right picture. And this was just an example of some of the human psychology research we do. If you notice in the picture, one's wearing these like, it looks like collars, they're called mood sweaters, and they're meant to help with empathy because they show what emotions you're feeling. And that was one of the many different types of research projects we've done on missions. And we do also a lot of outreach and educational work. We have different media groups take part in missions. Space Drop is a recent movie that came out uh, that was filmed during a two week lunar simulation. I organize different competitions for uh, high school students in Slovakia, where I'm from. That's just an example of students uh, uh, proposing a project where we would dissolve our human hair to create fertilizer to grow plants with during missions. And finally, just some contact details in case you have questions or would like some more information. So, thank you for your attention. Hopefully you were able to see all that. Now I'm not sure how to exit the screen sharing. Uh, let's see, how does one do that? I can do that for you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so, uh, Kai, welcome back. Um, would don't you like worry. to pick up from where you left off? Would you like to try again and just... Uh... I actually don't know. I went through my whole presentation, so I actually no idea. I didn't know that it crashed until I was done. You were talking about the training facility. So, I mean, from the very top, like just from, from the Biosphere 2 slide? Yeah, pretty early on. <laughs> okay, let's try again. Um, just a moment. <laughs> okay, I'm not sure. I'll try to keep an eye on it in case it crashes again. Okay, can you see my screen? Oh, let me stop my video just a moment. Yes, here we go. That's up. Okay. Yeah, you're good. Do you see the screen? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, okay, I'll try to make fast. Thank you for letting me have a second shot.
Um, so we are building a space analog for the moon Mars at Biosphere 2, which is a bomb down uh, facility outside of Oracle, Arizona. And uh, of course, it has a link that goes back to the late 80s and early 90s, where eight people were still in for two years. So there's a lot of lessons learned, a lot of things that we're carrying forward with the, the experience of that facility. And we have the great fortune of using the test module, which was the prototype built before the biosphere in 1987, it operated from 1989. Um, the eight biospherians are shown standing on top of a lung. Uh, this facility was used for up to three weeks with fully bioregenerative uh, life support. So it's basically a sealed greenhouse, a medically sealed greenhouse. Um, incredible um, way in which they maintain the pressure using a, a lung. Let's see. The messages and uh, so my my good friend and associate Trent Tresh, um, he and I started working on the reconstruction of this uh, with volunteers and with the World Biosphere Two team on uh, January twentieth, and we've been going nonstop, gangbusters, eighteen hours a day for two and a half months straight. Um, we've been grinding and sanding and vacuuming and rewiring and painting um, and getting this facility up and running. We're doing everything we can, every step of the way is done with a, an eye to the science. So knowing that you're not actually the greenhouse on Mars, that it's been exposed to the radiation, we've covered all upper face and glass with an elastomeric to reduce the light and the thermal gain. Um, we've also applied window tint that is specifically designed to reduce the ambient light with those windows that are horizontal, looking at the fixing atmosphere to just 50% of the ambient light that's otherwise present in our zona. So when you're inside, you do notice a distinct difference. That also means that our plants will not be able to grow with synthetic light, which is also accurate to Mars. We've also had the great pleasure of working with Dr. Cameron Smith and Pacific Space Flight. Um, I've been a member of that team for five or six years now. Trent is the same. Uh, for those of you at Veneris, you're going to love your suits. Um, I've seen your suits, and they're being shipped off soon. They're beautiful. And we have two suits coming to our facility as well. Um, and this is Dr. This is uh, John Adams. He's the deputy director of Biosphere, and he conducted our first pressure suit test a number of weeks ago as a simulation. Really fabulous experience. This is uh, our facility as of uh, two days ago. You can see it's coming along nicely. And this is an artist rendering by years to trying to what it will look like when we're finished with the uh, three ship containers and earth burned marja. Rendering of the inside of the uh, of the growth space, of course, more complex and more dense than this, but kind of gives you an idea. And a layout of our crew quarters. Um, tentative, we're still playing with spin out and opportunities. This will be built out of three different shipping containers with two airlocks, one to the outside world, one into the greenhouse, in order to maintain pressure differentials, humidity, CO2 level changes. Uh, and actually pumping CO2 from the crew quarters into the greenhouse and using an oxygen concentrator in the greenhouse to put oxygen back into uh, the crew quarters. We're also working, Paragon has already delivered to us a full CO2 scrubber, and uh, that is operational as of hopefully the end of next week. And we'll be doing our first pressure test with CO2 scrubbing uh, by the end of May. This is uh, a facility right next door that we are rebuilding. It's a 6,400 square feet um, of space that we are rebuilding as a marsh yard. And we're working with NASA and with Arizona State University's JMARS to select an actual landing site on Mars, scaling that crater down and build a 1,604 square foot crater uh, that will include a lava tube, um, then also a gravity offset will be designed by one of Hollywood's top stuntmen um, in order that we can put people on harness and they will experience whatever gravitational field they want to have. Um, everything from you know, one six to one third or uh, all the way down to zero G if they just want to fly around. Uh, also, embedding gas pipes in the crater so that we can uh, distribute various gases, trace gases, and water vapor and such, and have autonomous drone uh, autonomous rover studies that can try to discover you know, gases on Mars. And I think I've gone through all the items that are on this list. Um, and I just want to say thanks to Bastro 2, National Geographic, Paragon, uh, U of A, SEAC, and NASA for all the support and financing to make this possible. So, I this time, can I make it through? That's brilliant. Thanks, Kai. All right, Attila, you I can. Saw, I saw a head point. Okay, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. That uh, was awesome. Yes, that I was really yeah. <laughs> It all worked. Sorry, great. I was getting excited with every slide that was able to see more. I was like, ah, this is awesome. So sorry, that's me. Okay, that would mean. Thank you. Thank you for giving me a second chance. Appreciate it. <laughs> all right, Attila, are you able to hear me? Uh, sorry, yes. This is my. Is it my turn? 
Yes. Yes, um, I can hear you perfectly. Excellent. Take it away. Okay. Yeah, let me start sharing. Can you see my screen now? Not yet. I think the internet on your end might be quite slow. Okay, give me a second. There we go. Yeah, I'm super. Okay, perfect. So, hello, thank you so much for inviting me to the conference. My name is Atila Misados. I am the system director of MDRS, the Mars Easter Research Station. Our analog was built almost 20 years by now. Um, to this year, we have had more than 200 different crews from all around the world. I love this picture, the, this first picture, because one of the key features uh, and the major features that MDRS has is that it's situated in a great, great Mars analog. It's a uh, late Jurassic Morrison formation in the San Rafael swell in the Colorado Plateau. Uh, well, MDRS is an operational analog. Um, we have an analog astronaut training program. The picture that you see right here is uh, all our facilities or all our campus. I, I don't think you can see our remote observatory where we're going through all the pictures and all the facilities really fast right now. So our main, this is our habitat. This is our main module. It's the two stories. The first floor, the first deck is the EVA room. That's where all the suits are stored there and the crew prepared for, go, for going to EVAs in there, the second floor, uh, the upper deck is the crew quarters. And um, we used to have uh, the science lab in the lower deck, but as we kept expanding, now we have our own separate building specifically for doing research. Uh, we have a green hat. We don't Attila, have enough. Sorry to interrupt you. We don't produce enough. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, your no slides. Are, what happened? Your slides are not changing. We're still on the first slide. Oh, okay. Um, okay, what about now? Can you see the campus? Yeah, that's right. We can see the plants. Oh. Uh, oh. Now we're... So, can you see it now? I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm in the RS right now. And one of the challenges that we have here is our internet because it's satellite. Yeah, we can see MDRS is an operational analog with an analog astronaut training program. OK, perfect. So this is the campus. Uh, we're going through the pictures through each facility really fast. Uh, this is the main hat, as I was telling you. It has two, two floors. First floor is for the uh, EVA room, and the second floor is the crew quarters. We host uh, teams from six to eight people. We can host up to 10, uh, but usually our crews are conformed between six and eight. Uh, we have uh, a small green half, and as I was, say, as I was saying, uh, we don't produce enough food to be the whole diet for the analog astronauts, but it's a great complement to their diet. Uh, there's a lot of research going on here, uh, hydroponics, aquaponics, etc. cetera. Uh, of course, we have the science zone. Uh, where we also have our energy, our power system, and has one of the best views of the campus. Uh, our two observatories, the one in the top is our solar observatory donated by Elon Musk, and the one below, it's our remote observatory. Anyone can access to it. Uh, you just have to go to our website and ask to uh, get into the program, do the training, and you, can, you will be able to get these amazing photographs. Uh, and the last building that was added in 2017 is the RAM, the Repair and Assembly Module. It's basically where all our engineering is happening and also for repairs for our ATV, ATVs and our rovers. As most of uh, the analysts, we also have simulated suits and we use the Polaris Rangers as a vehicle for transportation during AVAs. And that's it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Attila. All right, Rayut, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you very much. 
So hello everybody, I'm gonna share my presentation shortly. My name is uh, Ryut Sarek Abramovich. I have a PhD in microbiology and immunology from the University of New South Wales. Um, I find, first of all, thank you for inviting me today. There is a lot of depth and originality to the discussions and the content here. I find it very refreshing and stimulating. So thank you so much for inviting me. I'm an astrobiologist. During my PhD, I worked on stromatolites at Shark Bay. I also did a field expedition with NASA in South Australia. And I'm a co-founder of certain of several space exploration NGOs in Israel. I had the pleasure of being an analog astronaut in one of DMARS missions. And since then, I'm, I'm absolutely hooked. So let me now try and share a bit of my presentation. It's super short. Um, I didn't want to take too much of a time, so I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do share. I'm going to do share screen. Thank you very much. Here we go. Can everybody see my screen at the moment? Yeah, it looks good. Thank you very much. So um, what are we to do with analog missions? So first of all, here in Israel, DMARS, which stands for Desert Mars Analog Ramon Station, is mainly involved in educational activities. So we are allowing teachers, children, and the general public to understand through their senses in the real world how hard and exciting it is will, will be to actually live and do science on Mars. Our habitat, known as Hub01, is really accessible, but it's situated in a beautiful desert Mars-like topography, which enables analog mission to feel really real and isolated. This is a part of the schematic of the Hub01 that you can look and take a nice interest into, designed by Shika Architects and Moshe Sagai. And later on this year, we're gonna have an international project, Amadi 2020, that will arrive at our doorstep. It was supposed to happen last year and COVID thwarted all our, blocked all our uh, actions and plans. So this is going to be a unique collaboration between the Israel Space Agency, the Mitzpah Ramon Council, and the Austrian Space Forum. So please stay in touch and check out how an international collaboration on Mars exploration takes wings between our two countries. It's gonna be later on this year. We're gonna have a new habitat, uh, different from this design that it's gonna be erected uh, in the next coming months. Um, what do I wanna do? So first of all, this is part of the Students Are Young Astronaut Analog Mission, which is done, which this year was uh, managed by me at the ADSSC. We basically allow high school students to do analog missions. They prep for it for about a year. Uh, it's a long preparation to make sure that you have the right team, the right people, that they understand their responsibilities because we allow them to do these missions on their own. There is an instructor, but we're like 50 meters or 150 meters away from this habitat and they have to do the science experiments and everything by themselves. It's a very exciting program. I've been the manager and co-manager since 2017. And, it, and it's a very unique experience for high school students and they learn a lot about space sciences, space sciences, different space sciences, but also about themselves, how they wanna treat each other, how they can work as a team. And for as far as I know, this is globally unique. We don't have another youth program using analog missions and we give them hard time in it, I have to say. It's not an easy thing to do. So when we look at Mitzpah Ramon, and when I look at my experience from Israel, what I really want to do is I plan to keep aiming really high with analog mission. So currently I'm actually working on using analog mission as a platform for a regional Middle East ongoing long-term development program to bring women to the forefront of everything, basically the forefront of their lives, their career, their family, their communities, uh, their people. So I hope to use this amazing platform, which is Analog Missions, and to bring together a group of women from different countries in the Middle East to train together for a space mission, uh, and eventually perhaps to fly even to space as the prices are a bit going down recently. And after which they will come home safely, they will be proud, and they will be able to provide innovative solutions to their own needs in the oral community in the Middle East. Um, I think that the region would love to have a space-related collaboration. I think the Middle East is the cradle of civilization. I think it's super diverse, so you can find super and different ideas and solutions to different problems that we're gonna have with space and living in space. Um, I'm absolutely sure combining analog missions and training uh, within the Middle East will make wonders for my regions and for my home. So if you feel passionate about women in space as I do and about the region, 
uh, feel free to find me and talk to me. All my details are like in LinkedIn and Facebook and so on and so forth. So thank you very much and hope to see you uh, in Israel later on this year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ray. That was fantastic. And last but not least, Julio. Hello. Thanks so much for uh, inviting me to be with with this this panel today. Uh, uh, I'd like to see if possible see my screen. Uh, uh, yeah, power, my PowerPoint. Yes. Okay, uh, I, will be, I will try to be quickly. Uh, I'd like to say about the Amazon rainforest. I'm, I'm based in Brazil, but I'd like to say that we present in Brazil many different ecosystems, I, as you can see here. One of these ecosystems is called Caatinga, that means right field, uh, because it's a semi arid region in Brazil. As, as as you can see here, we are in the corner of, of South, South America, close to Africa. And then the name of Caatinga or right field uh, is because of this kind of landscape, because during the uh, great part of the year, uh, becomes like this. And then uh, we have great challenge relates how to deal with, uh, how, how to be sustainable in an environment like this. And then what we are doing is very connected with sustainable development goals. We are two hours from Natal, where I live, to Abtati uh, Marti. In, in the coast is wet, but in the countryside, uh, like uh, last week, we identified 15% uh, uh, of humidity, okay, of moisture. And then this presents some challenge, almost to present, uh, almost to produce food. And then this is our facade, and then also a, a bigger picture. The big build, the first building is the the auditorium, uh, the main building, and then this blue area is our greenhouse. And then in this case, in the the main building, we present something around uh, 108 square meters. And the, air, the area of the greenhouse, call it biohabitat, we have more at 200 square meters. And also we receive re, uh, a students there uh, before pandemics. And then well, our challenge is be a self-sustaining habitat. And then this is based on main, main three aspects uh, related to smart sanitation. Uh, we need to collect the water, uh, the rainwater, also uh, uh, do the treatment of sewage, uh, also the production of own food in the greenhouse using aquaponics and hydroponics, and also the third point as the use of off-grid energy. Uh, in this case, that these three three points, uh, three dimensions, are very related to also some some demands that we need for for the operation of future space habitats. And then great parts of discussions and development of protocols to operate these three dimensions are also will be common to future space habitats in, in Mars and Moon. Uh, also, uh, parts of our articles and presentations are dealing uh, how this would be operating a, in an analog habitat and also in future space habitats. And then here we have some photos of the construction. Also, in the aquaponics, we, we have the tilapia filler. And one of our challenges produce the, the food to be consumed in our in our missions. This is a second aquaponic system. Also, we are very connected to, to some so, uh, social innovations uh, to also be applied to uh, uh, developing communities. And this is like a, a blueprint uh, scheme of our our greenhouse. In this case, we have aquaponics. Also, the water tanks, these red circles are new water tanks of uh, 1,000 lit liters, okay? And then some food produced there. Also, we are interested in, the, in some research with cactus, uh, with some plants uh, that can deal with water stress. Uh, also, hydrogel to cultivate food. And something interesting, in our location, we have a extinct volcano. Uh, it's a uh, 40 minutes driving from Habitat Marti. Uh, then uh, uh, it's also a, a photo of our landscape in our, our space suit, generating a new space suit. And then in this volcano, we, we present a very analog uh, landscape uh, and we collect the soil there and we did an analysis. 
And this, this soil presents uh, some similarities with the, the soil used by JPL, uh, by NASA, for the tests of, of the rovers in California. And then this is very interesting to, to see uh, uh, a lot of experiments in terms of the, also the uh, agriculture experiments. Also, we are organizing a space habitat event. I'd like to, to share and invite everyone to be part. Uh, then, uh, since uh, operating with, with the in our uh, habitat, we we reach uh, 32 missions until March of last year. Then happens the COVID, and then we developed a new methodology of virtual missions. And then we depart from uh, six missions to 36, and then also from around 20 to 220. Uh, then uh, some uh, a fact sheet about the our activities in this case last year we had 36 missions uh, also we are operating 200 square meters also we are the only space analog station in a southern hemisphere in a developing country and also operate a component system uh, and also we, i could say that we maybe we were the pioneers operating virtual missions also now we are achieving more than 70 missions and more than 300 participants, okay? And then in the virtual missions, we have seven facilities and then a lot of discussions about these facilities. Uh, the participants, the online participants in virtual missions, they will be developing uh, characteristics of this, the features of each specific facility. And then they are developing very good content, okay? These are, are the facilities. Uh, and then the, some parts of the results of the discussions are, uh, are recorded in, in videos, and then these videos is shared in our uh, uh, YouTube channel. And a lot of these discussions had transformed in abstracts and full papers uh, presented in, in conferences around the world. And then we are very uh, happy uh, because part of our virtual discussion, uh, virtual missions, we it was possible to transform in in, uh, in academic results, and then the, we believe that this is very important to our goals and our impact. And this, these are some countries that uh, already uh, participate in our missions. And then this is my contact. Uh, and thanks for the attention. Thank you very much, Julio. That was brilliant. It's amazing how unique each of these habitats are. Um, and if we've got time, I'd love to talk more about that later. Um, and I'm just gonna open up questions now. So I just wanna start with talking about crews. What do you think makes a good analog astronaut and a good cohesive crew? Uh, and feel free, whoever wants to go first to address that question. Yeah, Attila? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there are many, characteristics as an individual and it's different from a team. I think at MDRS what we always look for is flexibility, not being married to your plans. You, There's so many changes so fast that you need to roll with whatever happens. You need to be adaptable. Uh, we also want people, we, we don't want high riskers. We, we want people that feel comfortable assuming a risk, but they're not actively seeking them. And I think it's really important also to be very open about what you're doing and not, by, not trying to hide anything from, to, from mission support or from your team. I think that's some of the characteristics we want in an individual. And as a team, I think what makes great team, at least at MDRS, is diversity either in age, in gender, in skills, nationalities, life experience. That's what enriches the team. And I'll say having a common language is also very important for any kind of emergencies. You need to be able to respond quickly and being very clear during your mission. Fantastic. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to add? Yeah, Michaela, go for it. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I was just going to add, um, I found that just being very empathetic is very important. Not be too empathetic, but to try and understand every person's point of view, realize that everyone is dealing with the stressful situation differently. 
And so to have patience with each other and then the communication, as was mentioned, is also important. I found that if people keep things in, they tend to kind of you know, explode at times and you may not say uh, very nice things to someone else and regret that later. So actually talking openly about how you're feeling and just tell people, oh, I'm having a bad day today. I'm sorry, I'm going to be grumpy. You know, please don't take it personally. But basically just openly communicating about things, of course, politely, ideally. Um, those are two other factors that I've seen kind of be a recurrent element of all, all the missions that I've been involved with. Uh, let's yeah. you're on mute. Let me unmute you. Okay, go for it. Also, interestingly, Miguel is also a recurring element of most of the missions right now in, in, in high seas. So and this is also very important uh, because you have like this commander role, but also someone that is a host. As uh, And this is the same with the mission control. Like the mission control is something that also needs to be part of the team and team needs to feel that this is part of, that they are part of the crew because then you can have some uh, tensions. Uh, on the line between crew and the outside. So this is also important to some extent. Exactly. Go for it, Kai. So I think these are yeah, excellent responses. Um, to build off of both, both Attila and, uh, and Michaela, I think that having a strong leader, and strong doesn't necessarily mean a loud voice or strong will, but somebody that everyone respects as the leader is really important. And that could be a soft-spoken person, it could be a loud, obnoxious person, it doesn't matter as long as everyone respects them. Because you know, there, there's instances, like when I was in NDRS with Michaela, which is how I first met her, um, I had gone about 10 nights with only three hours of sleep each night, and I was losing it. <laughs> and and oh. my commander said, who's Ash was about 20 oh. years younger than me, and he said, Kai, go take a nap. <laughs> and so I did, and everything was better after that. <laughs> But I respected him, and so I did, and it, and it worked. It's to have somebody who you trust, and, and you even when you're in a hard place, you recognize that their point of view is important. Yeah, that's true. And sometimes you need to be called out. Uh, so we have a related question from one of our audience members. Uh, they, the name is Julio, and they ask, if there are any known issues with analog facilities, is it standard practice to disclose these issues to the crew or do the crews discover these issues to enhance the fidelity of the sim? I go for it, Lesson. Uh, so, any like uh, part of your habitat that is not working properly is potentially dangerous, and you should train your your crew to know your habitat before you close and isolate them in this facility. So, the number one rule is safety. So we are not doing strange surprises on your with your capacity for people. Um, that's not add, it's not adding to the scene, it's it's adding to danger. We have another question from our audience. Oh go for it, Kai, yeah. I I just, just add quickly that um, I've, I've learned just recently in extensive conversations with Attila when he was at SAM and also with Shannon Rupert, the director of, of MDRS that Michaela, you probably know this already, that we were the one of the last teams at MDRS before it was rebuilt and, and, and Shannon came back and really got it running again well. So we were not aware of all of the challenges of the physical infrastructure of that building. And it was it was a disaster and it was a little bit rough, but we as a team came together to address those issues. And I think that was one of the unifying things for our team was, well, this is what we have to work with, let's make it work. And, and I'm not putting MDRS down, I'm saying that since then, MD, you know, Shannon's come back and Attila and, and Linnea, you guys have done a great job of really the facility. Um, but yeah, at that time, it would have been nice if we had a little bit of a heads up to say, these are known issues. The toilet doesn't work, um, <laughs> you know, the shower doesn't work. Um, so I think it is important if there are facilities issues that you know in advance. So when you get there, you're expected, you're, you're, you're expecting the real situation. I might just add quickly, I, I think there's an important difference between a simulated, you know, something malfunctioning at a station and something that's actually malfunctioning. And so, uh, like, like Lessig said, it's, it's very important to make the crew be aware of things that are, you know, tricky to use or don't work properly or all the caveats, so they're trained to deal with that. And then if you want to add those surprise elements, make sure it's something that won't put the crew's you know, health and safety at risk and things like that. So we do do that at high seas. 
but I make sure the timing is right and all that where, you know, it's not going to cause any issues for the crew. Fantastic. Okay. So um, we have a couple more questions from the audience, but uh, before we go into those, so as I was saying, like a lot of these, Ray, did you want to say something? Yeah, I want to answer the question for the panel. Do you want to speak it out loud first? Uh, is this the one that's just come in? Yeah. What? Uh, I was just gonna, before we, we can okay. go to that one, but I was going to ask a different question first. Sure. Um, and my first, my question was going to be, mm -hmm. uh, given the uniqueness of each of these habitats, have there been any joint missions? And do you think that it, there would be a lot of benefit to conducting some joint missions? Short answer, yes, but someone can elaborate. <laughs> Uh, I'd love to answer that question. Sorry. No, go for it, tell. Oh, perfect. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I think the the, the answer is definitely yes. Uh, the challenge we have to face now is we need more dialogue between stations. We all do different work. We all have different objectives, but we share the same basis and the same goals. And I think I don't know who, who told me this uh, lately. Say instead of trying and from competition, uh, we should completely focus to try from collaboration. Uh, like in the case of Kai and Sam, I mean, that's one of the first analogs that have reached to us and say, hey, what do you do and how do you do this? And I think that's a great, uh, that's a great start. And I think this conference is a great uh, a start to start making this a snowball role. We don't have a consortium. Uh, we need a platform where we can know what's going on in the other analogs because a lot of times we are doing the same research once and one like again and again and again and we are not adding anything new because we don't have a great communication between analogs and I think that that should be the start but I definitely think joint missions will be a great step for us. I think that there's some unique opportunities, if we go back to the science objectives, there's a unique opportunities to do plant growth studies, do mineralogy studies, do atmospheric studies that can be done simultaneous in three or four analogs at the same time, where you have some controlled variables, some changing variables, and by doing those studies over with, with a distinct starting and stopping point in these different geographic regions and different atmospheric conditions, some of them, some of them sealed, some you know, open, um, I think we come up with some really unique combined papers for publication and really um, and there'd be some fun things we could do, whether it's a plant growth study or whether it's sampling, um, you know, a geological survey of the, of the area around the habit. There's some fun things that we could do. Totally, I can totally agree. But what we have all in common, despite we are in different locations, some habitats are located in analog environments, like it's interesting geological, uh, geological sites. Uh, some habitats are isolation facilities. We all have analog astronauts, and this human factors research can be already shared uh, and, and coordinated, regardless of your infrastructure with, uh, regarding plants or other stuff. So, analog astronauts are the main value here, and what happens on uh, those joints of different fields of studies here. So, this is probably what we can do all already, very quickly. We have a question from an audience member, Roxy, who's asking, what's the difference between a low fidelity and a high fidelity analog? Are there any standards for this nomenclature? Uh, Julia, would you like to answer that question? Okay. Yes, uh, I believe uh, if you have more uh, isolation or like like we uh, like the simulations that we have is happening in in, in drs and high seas also i believe that maybe also when is happening the the missions in dmars uh, i believe there is a the the wilderness the wilderness and also the desert conditions i believe the also the physical isolation of the facility as you can see in it is very important, and uh, like uh, some uh, uh, something that was uh, discussed uh, before, 
uh, maybe something interesting would be uh, if you have communications between the stations during the missions. And now it's happening in missions in, in, in high seas and MDRS and Lunaris, uh, uh, presidential missions. Uh, and then if you we imagine the, a future uh, uh, habitat on Mars, uh, maybe in the future you have one, two, three uh, different habitats. And then maybe it would be interesting activity if you have uh, like a like a protocol between the uh, during a, during the mission a, a moment like 30 minutes or one hour between the the members of each each uh, station that's happening the missions during the same time to uh integration because if you have five in one one station six members in all the station then it would be interesting to uh, have a, a call uh, with everybody uh, to see because in the future uh, if you have like a, a constellation of, of uh, habitats on Mars, I believe this would be necessary, no? Absolutely. Yeah, go for it, Kai. I think we, we use the word high fidelity in, in line with Sam. And, and there, no, I don't think there's a distinct, I'm, I'm not aware of a, of, a, of a strict definition or like a boundary of what's low fidelity and high fidelity. For us, I can only speak for what it means for us. So for us, it means that every single step of construction is put through some some scientific test some kind of rigorous test so even when we're selecting our paint we went back to nasa to their mars habitat design team and said what kind of paint would you use and they're guiding us and saying we only use this or we prefer this we don't want this no plastics all metal aluminum and steel um, so we're really making certain that every single step of the way is is guided by that as i said the elastomeric that we put on top no, you wouldn't have a greenhouse on Mars, period. It, it, based on the current technology, everything's going to be underground. But we want to simulate that to the best of our ability. So we've chosen those things. When you actually come to our habitat, as Scott said this morning, Dr. Um, Scott, um, the, the astronaut, he said that you know, when, when you constrain the variables, when you put somebody in a situation in which if you make a misstep, there are real ramifications, that's high fidelity. And so in SAM, the teams can choose to be regulated airflow or sealed. If they choose sealed, everything they do, every breath they take is changing the environment around them. And if they exercise in the morning, they're gonna change the amount of CO2 that's produced and we change the amount of oxygen that has to be you know, compensated. And so even you can't bring deodorant, you have, we, we tell you which shampoo you get to use because it doesn't go anywhere, it stays in the habitat. There's no bleach, no cleaning agents, there's no meat allowed. Um, and so, because there's no way we can process that meat after you've, you know, after you've processed it in your body, where there's no place we can put it. Um, the plants don't want it. So that, I think, increases the fidelity. And that's our definition. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It's just what we're shooting for is the highest fidelity. But then high seas and MDRS have the, have the remote. They're way out in the middle of nowhere. We don't have that option. I think that's kind of a level of fidelity as well. This is exactly your last remark was also something that I would love to stress. Like there is a, uh, you can tell, you can tell about fidelity in regard, in regard to uh, the architecture of the habitat. So if you are getting this as a prototype in some sorts of the habitat, or you can uh, talk about fidelity when it comes to environment. So, um, so there are different fidelities because, and this is something that we also need to agree upon because there is no, I guess, one definition of analog mission. But from what I can take, analog mission is a research method. So a research method that focuses on investigating one or several aspects of crew space mission, missions using like earth, earthly real life scenarios as an analog to an off-world scenario. So by extent, analog habitat is a research tool, but it is sometimes it is focused on your research, uh, but also your research angle. So, uh, MDRS High Seas was built as a uh, as a as a facility six astronauts with a certain um, plan and, and and program for them to simulate those um, missions as a whole. But at that time, like those prototypes were a lot smaller, like Hera or She Habitat. They were like pr pr prototypes that hosted two or four people, so, but they were like technological prototypes. And now uh, Sam seems like something that is going a step further 
this combining the two, those two aspects, and this is really exciting to see. Uh, and well, I would love to visit uh, some, some, sometime in the future. So we're uh, running out of time now, but there's time for one more question from the audience. Um, so what are the most important considerations when designing a new space analog facility? For example, location, building materials, logistics. Uh, Ray, would you like to start with that? Yeah. yeah, it's a huge question. So basically it really depends who is the customer, who is the client and who wants to do what. Um, if you wanna do something which is related to space agency, then you really have to consider all their uh, particulate uh, demands and requirements if you want to do something that relies to that. If the end goal is eventually to have as much access to the public to get to your habitat and enjoy and really experience it, then you cannot put it in a very isolated area, in my opinion, because then you're not going to see a lot of public participation uh, in your program. And it's going to be very um, expensive to get there. It's going to be very hard to transport materials and so on and so forth. So basically there are three, I think the whole issue of um, designing a new space analog is based on three uh, really important um, criteria in my opinion. I said the customer and everything, but actually what I'm, what I'm really thinking about is, is first the location, which what type of customer you're thinking of at the end. Also whether you want to have a mobile or a steady fast, uh, stable, uh, construction. There's huge implication to each one of these. Very interesting implications, by the way, for each of these types of, of constructions. And the third is, is actually, who's your team? Okay, who's your team? Who's your team with which you're going to, to build this new space analog? It's never a one person thing. You always need a team of people, someone who is an architect, someone who's a scientist, someone who is definitely engineering, uh, someone who knows the environment in which you are aiming, which you think it's a very different issue to build something in the desert than to build something inside a cave. Completely different uh, atmospheric conditions and um, things to, to take into consideration. So first of all, who's your team? Because at the end of every analog mission, it's the team. It's the people behind it, the people who manage the mission and manage the organization, which eventually allows for a new space analog facility to work during the year. and. And, and then, of course, the people with whom you're actually going to work really, really, really hard uh, to make an actual habitat work. So it's a, it's a big question. But the threes are the people, I would say the location, <laughs> and I would say mobile or uh, steady. But that's my opinion. Anybody else wants to add to that? Uh, we are actually at the top of the hour, unfortunately. I mean, we could keep this conversation going, I think, for ages, but uh, we have unfortunately run out of time. So thank you, everybody, for speaking today. Um, and we hope you're enjoying the rest of the conference. And uh, on to the next panel. Thank you thanks so everyone. much. Yes. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks. Congratulations.